Um, we... Could I mention, uh, there's one character from my undergraduate days I didn't mention, and really should have. Um, uh, I don't know whether you've ever come across the name Ziegler. I have. Charlie Ziegler. Right. Who... Um, during the war, when there was nobody much about, I think he probably taught every every first year law student, <laughs> 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 and um, uh, absolutely, uh, he worked from dusk to dawn. No, the other way round, dawn to dusk, every day. Um, I think he was a lecturer in Pembroke, but he was never a fellow. Right. He was uh, half Burmese, oh. um, and he was a wonderful teacher. And I, I, uh, it wasn't just the Trinity people, first years, I think, who were sent to him. I think the whole university sent their first years <laughs> to him. <laughs> so there was a certain mechanical nature to some of his... Uh, Tutorials, some of his supervisions, but uh, he was he was father. He he was deeply deaf, and beasts that we were. He had a microphone in the middle of the table, and he was an old man. And occasionally, he'd go off to sleep, <laughs> and we found that tapping the microphone with a pencil <laughs> worked wonders. <laughs> <laughs> He was a very, very good teacher, actually. But he, they gave him rooms, and I think he was a college lecturer, and he taught from eight in the morning till eight at night every day of the week except Sunday. Commendable. <laughs> 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 and he was an extremely nice man. And... Uh, uh, I think he was the only wartime teacher I ha had who actually asked me to his home for a meal. Oh, lovely. Well, really something, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, and, you know, in wartime, just producing meals was uh, something you didn't do at the drop of a hat. <laughs> well, physically. Anyway, no, I wanted to mention him, so I didn't... He didn't get forgotten. Thank you. Um... It, well, in the first interview, Professor Wilson, we spoke about your life from 1923 to 1955, and perhaps we can deal with your academic life from 1955 onwards today. But before we do that, I wonder if we could go back re retrospectively to what must have been a very important event in your legal career. You say in your book, or in your preface to studies in the history of the common law that you, and I quote, had been diverted to the law by one accident and then to its history by another. And when you spoke in the last interview about your time at Penn State, you'd already settled on the history of law as what one might call your chosen topic. And I wondered when this decision had come to you. Perhaps as an undergraduate, as an undergraduate at Trinity, uh, I quite enjoyed it as an undergraduate, and my um, director of studies in my last year was H. A. Holland, whom you must have heard of, um, uh, who said that he was a legal historian. <laughs> <laughs> he never wrote anything about anything as far as I know <laughs> in, among the fellows of Trinity in those days writing was somehow deemed a bit in for a dig I think Pat, Patrick Duff didn't ever write no, he, Patrick Duff did write one article uh, Harry Holland I don't think ever wrote anything <laughs> um, but it was he who perhaps inspired you to think about legal history as a, a focus well uh, yeah yeah and 
I quite enjoyed it, and I thought there must be more to it than what emerged from an undergraduate <laughs> course in naval <laughs> history. <laughs> so, um, self-indulgence, really, but um, Trinity had given me a job, so I didn't have to worry about that. Um, so it didn't much matter whether I did something that people wanted or not. <laughs> and nobody wanted legal history and they still don't <laughs> well in 19 from 1955 to 56 you were at the London School of Economics did you actually move to London Professor Wilson? oh yes and what subjects did you teach there Quite a lot, actually. Um, mainly property. Um, I have enough, I think I always refused to teach taught because I knew I didn't know enough about that. Contract I thought I knew enough about. I didn't, but I thought I did. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think I taught contract, but mostly it was property. And legal history for anybody who wanted it. And, there weren't many fools in the LSE who did want it. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you live quite close to LSE? A year, I think we were mostly in Chiswick. Right. right. In a rather miserable flat in Chiswick with a lunatic neighbour. Was this the first time? Yes. I see, right. Oh. A really <laughs> lunatic neighbour. I mean. ah. She was... Huh? The nastiest woman I've ever met. In one of the flats? Yeah, and she proved it every day, all oh, day. I'm trying. <laughs> really, yes. It was horrid. Oh, yeah, mm. absolutely. Her husband was an MP who parked her in this flat and never came near her. <laughs> <laughs> so many people complained about her that Eventually, the land agent who was running the flats um, got in touch with the authority. You know who he got in touch with. Anyway, there came a little delegation with one policeman and two doctors hoping to certify her. Oh, and she yeah. saw them off. Formidable. <laughs> <laughs> So our hope of release was gone. <laughs> <laughs> so you, after a year at the LSE, you moved to New College. That's where right. You were a lecturer. Yeah. And do you, can you recall the circumstances of the move to New College? Did you apply for a position? Or how, how did you how how did you come to move to New College, Professor Wilson? Um, uh, they very kindly t took the initiative. A friend had had said, "Look, I see there's this uh, post going in Oxford. It's a, you'd, I'm sure it'd be better for you than LSE." Uh, but I didn't apply. But somebody told them about me, and they asked me to go and dine in the typical Oxford way. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, you were accustomed to yes. from your Trinity days. Yeah, yeah. So that was um, that. Was that. So do, do you have any recollections of colleagues from this period at New, at, um, New College? The warden was an extraordinary man called Smith. And he was a bachelor um, and had a fairly unpleasant dog that used to chase visitors. <laughs> was all right by him. <laughs> and... Um, 
he was a real eccentric. He he buttonholed somebody in the quad. He was always buttonholing people, and said, "You're Jones." And he, the chap said, "No, I'm not. I'm McPherson." You're not Mc, Mc, McPherson was killed in the war. <laughs> in the war. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he was an oddball, but a, a kindly oddball actually. Um, the Bursa, my predecessor as Lord Tutor, became Bursa, and that's how the vacancy for the law tutor's job came up. And that was a man called Butterworth, J.B. Butterworth, who um, left in a huff because they wouldn't make him registrary uh, and went to... I'm sorry, you're just about catching me in time before my memory finally goes. He, he went to Warwick and beca- as Vice-Chancellor of Warwick and was a very good Vice-Chancellor and, and made a first-rate university of it. Um, but um, he was a fairly impossible man. <laughs> <laughs> you were Dean Professor Milson of New College Mm? You were Dean of the College from 1959 to 1964. Yes, I can't now remember who, whom I succeeded. Yes, I was. Do you have any recollections of your, your role as, as Dean? Well, they, I mean, they, the things that survive in the memory are the funny bits. Um, like... Uh, the night porter ringing me up at two in the morning and saying he was a man of few words and his one word on that occasion was explosions. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought this sounded serious and nothing was going. And it transpired that somebody had spent a fruitful evening with those bird scarer things uh, which are strung out along a fuse. Um, and if you were skillful, you could easily throw them up to hang over a gargoyle. Uh, <laughs> and there were these busted bangs going off the whole time. And I told the night porter to lurk in a dark corner while I walked round. Uh, the dark corner he was he had to lurk in was one where they'd left a string of these damn things. <laughs> he wasn't <busy. laughs> It was, needless to say, uh, all this was um, enemies from Modern College. And uh, I don't like to think what happened to Modern the next night. I'd rather, I'd rather never know. <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, I, the other recollection was um, a very rich man whose name will come back to me in due course and you may know it anyway because he gave kings that um, altarpiece which they put at the east end of their chapel thereby ruining the chapel in my opinion Mm -hmm. Um, and he rang up the warden and said, um, uh, I, I live in a flat and it's, I haven't got room for all my pictures and I've got this El Greco I want to get rid of. Would you like to have it? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I'd been the warden, I would have assumed it was a hoax. But he was an experienced man and said, yes, of course. And um, the benefactor drove up was driven up by his chauffeur one Saturday afternoon 
and I went round to, to help. And the warden and I went, the, the chauffeur carrying the picture, the benefactor carrying a hammer and nail, <laughs> the warden and I looking, looking scared. <laughs> and we got into the chapel, and the benefactor said, Well, how about there? And the warden said, Yes, that would be nice. So the chauffeur climbed his ladder and banged in a nail. And the, this picture, worth a, a fortune, was hung. And nothing is easier than to get into a college chapel. Um, so we uh, had a burglar alarm fitted and the, it was one of those damn things that go off every time a fly <laughs> passes through its <laughs> red. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent a good many restless nights having to go in because the night porter had run saying, Sir, alarm. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever did steal it, and so far as I know, it's still on its hook. <laughs> Incredible. Mm. Very nice picture. But it, that was... The, to be rich enough to be casual about something yes. like that would be really being rich. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We we asked him to our grand dinner. He said, it's very kind of you, I don't like grand dinners and I can't bear dinner jackets, so would you mind if I don't come? <laughs> 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 so, I wish I could remember his name, it'll come to me. But I expect King's probably have mentioned his name in in the guide to the chapel that they do out, yeah. Right, I'll, I'll look it up. Very interesting. It, it was while you were at Oxford, Professor Wilson, that you began a series of visits, 12 in all, to um, NYU. Um, you, you, went, you visited NYU five times, and this was obviously a very... Um, a long and fruitful association. Did you have any um, recollections of how you first started going to NYU and the circumstances thereof? I think it they were... The NYU Law School very well endowed, a lot of money. Um, and they had been running for years summer courses for law teachers, where law teachers might go and learn the kind of thing that American law teachers probably wouldn't know about. And um, for years, Harry Lawson who was the professor of comparative law at Oxford by that time, was going and doing this. And, uh, I think he sold them the idea that they ought to put on legal history. Um, right. So I, there was, I think it was a three-year cycle, Roman law, comparative law, which was done by a series of mostly Frenchmen, um, uh, and legal history, which was me. And uh, these chaps knew nothing about legal history, didn't really want to know anything about legal history, but were quite good at asking difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was a useful experience, actually. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And enjoyable, because uh, New York City in August is not the ideal but the uh, dean at the time lent us his penthouse apartment, which was air-conditioned, and had a roof garden. Oh, delightful. <laughs> so we lived in the lap of luxury, as it were, yeah. Would, would this have been for a couple of months at a time? Mm? A couple of months at a time? Uh, uh, about six weeks. 
Jerusalem. Lovely, really. Yeah. And both the LSE and I suppose Oxford uh, were very good about letting me have leave to do it. They didn't, I mean, they, they stopped my pay for the duration, but since NYU was paying me for six weeks more than I earned in a year in London, <laughs> that was okay. <laughs> Professor Stein used to enjoy going to America very much. Professor Wilson, in Who's Who, your formal association with the Selden Society is dated to the last year of your time at Oxford. What was your role at, at this point in the Selden Society? It would have been, I suppose, about um, 1964. Or perhaps you, you joined the Selden Society a bit later. I, my memory, as, as you know, is far from reliable. Um, I was... The beginning of it all was that uh, Old Plucknett, who was the Professor of Legal History at London, um, became um, senile, to put it brutally, and the LSE eventually forged his signature on a letter of resignation. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but he, he, it didn't occur to him that he ought to resign from the Southern Society. And so I and two friends um, uh, Derek Hall now dead who was in Oxford and David Yale and the three of us became uh, as it were co-adjutors uh, to the failing bishop and um, uh, when he died um, each of us pointed the <laughs> finger <laughs> but the two of them ganged up on me and pointed at me so I got stuck with being literary director right. um, and I was safe for quite a long time um, quite a tiresome job because for one thing um, if you're producing a volume every year um, you've got to get people working on volumes and it's never their top priority mm -hmm. um, because it's not going to do much for their CV um, so you have to spend time hectoring them and then when they produce it you have to read the damn thing <laughs> try and get rid of the grosser mistakes <laughs> um, and then see it through the press it was it was and I was with that I was terribly lucky because uh, my wife um, was very used to dealing with printers and she had seen her first husband's uh, books through the press the Cambridge criminologist called Reginovich um, so she had lots of experience and she was anywhere very quick on the outtake and uh, so she did all that Oh, I still had to read the bloody thing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but she she dealt with printers. And is... Um, I still get a Christmas card every Christmas from one of the printers that she dealt with. Excellent. Extraordinary, Thank yeah. You. Yes. Um, Gosh. So... 
that's how that got done. I mean, if it had been left to me, the, the, nothing would have ever happened. And <laughs> So that was, that was the Southern Society, and it went on forever and ever. And I think I'm still on its council. Um, oh, they, then they made me president. That was a dirty trick. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was, I suppose, its centenary year. And our royal patron... Um, was persuaded to do things, and we had an enormous party. Um, and because it was known that the Duke of Edinburgh was going to be there, hundreds of our American members crossed the Atlantic to be present at this party. And I'd never, never seen them, I had no idea who they were. And I said to the equerry, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to introduce these people. Don't you worry, he said. <laughs> Just let him loose. <laughs> Which I did, and he was wonderful. <laughs> he spent a happy evening uh, talking to all kinds of people about all kinds of things that neither he nor they knew anything about. <laughs> he, he was really very good. And there was a big dinner to which he came, and it was a, a sad time for me. My my wife was, her senility was beginning to become obvious, but I knew it would cause trouble if she didn't come. So I got John Baker um, to volunteer his then wife, Veronica, uh, to look after my wife through the dinner, which she very nobly did. Um, while I was concentrating on uh, on trying to introduce as many rich members as I could to the Duke. <laughs> Uh, that, what year was that, Professor Wilson? That would have been... I do have the date, actually, when you were the president. It's at a later stage. Um, let me see. I'm, if you got uh, it from who's who, I'm sure you got it right. Because right. I didn't do that who's who entry, but my wife did. <laughs> <laughs> she got it right. <laughs> right. Um, yes, it would have been about... Could it be... Mm, not 1980. Ah, 1988. 1985 to 88, President. President, yes. Yes, yeah. right. And the centenary year was... Oh, 87, I think. Right. Every volume of the Southern Society has the date of its foundation printed on it, but I could never remember it. <laughs> <laughs> um, going a little bit back in time... In 1964, you moved back to LSE as Professor of Legal History. Yes. And are there any observations that you recall of this move back to the LSE? This was, would have been from Oxford. Well, I can remember my wife and I being deeply torn okay. and because we were happy in Oxford and they had a beautiful college house. <laughs> Lovely. And... Um, Uh, on the other hand, I, it was something I felt I couldn't couldn't refuse. Mm. Um, so we went and we bought this house in Greenwich. Um, did you live quite close to LSE? Mm? Did you manage to, to live quite close to LSE? No, we... Um, My wife and I had a lovely day. Um, we rang up every estate agent in London and um, 
they suggested things we might look at. So we started in the north and moved south. <laughs> and in the north, we, we couldn't begin to afford any, any of them. Um, I mean, Hampstead and all that was totally out. Um, uh, and we ended in Greenwich. Um, and a nice estate agent said, well, I haven't got anything for you. I've, I've got something that might be ideal for you, but the woman's mad and she's never going to sell. <laughs> <laughs> and that would have put me off, but my wife said, tell her we're coming. <laughs> 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 and so we went to view this house, which was a very nice house, um, in a, a row of nice houses, which had all been built by uh, a dishonest 18th century steward of the Earls of Dartmouth. They had their London, well, not their townhouse, but their semi-townhouse um, uh, in, in that road. Uh, and he invented the road and sold off plots and built all these houses. Um, all... Uh, 1690 to 1720, that sort of thing. Gosh. They're pretty. Lovely. Um, and we... Uh, my, my wife, as we approached, my wife said, we're going to have that house. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. <laughs> so you, you would have commuted... Yes. Yes, on the um, on the tube or the train. Um, I mostly went down Lewisham Hill to a real train, um, and my favourite real train meandered around South London um, through Denmark Hill um, and ended up at Blackfriars which was very convenient for the LSE. Lovely. Um, and uh, since it was such a roundabout train and since it wasn't much advertised, um, I had a, nearly always had the compartment to myself, never failed to have a corner seat <laughs> <laughs> so could, in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> so you could read and mm. use the time quite productively. Mm. It was actually quite a nice commute. And very occasionally I came back on the tube to Greenwich Station and that meant a very pretty but tiring walk uphill through Greenwich Park. Um, and uh, I'm afraid I didn't do that very often. I tended to take a bus, which stopped at the end of the road. So that was all right. It was okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was all right, except, except for the time when, as I was leaving the LSE, um, they were in revolt. They were always, the LSE was always in revolt. And um, a revolutionary handed me a paper. And since I had nothing else to do, I read it on the bus um, and it was absolutely riveting stuff uh, and I came to in Maidenhead <laughs> <laughs> so I had to telephone my wife and say I was going to be late <laughs> um, it was a really nasty beautifully written piece of work and I, I don't think it was written by the undergraduate revolutionaries. I, it was written by one of my colleagues, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we lived in that house throughout my time at the LSE. And it was um, amiable. Um, my... Two neighbours on one side were both Trinity men and my neighbours on the other side were both New College men where I'd just come from. So. Oh, well, um, 
Did, did you find that things had altered greatly in the eight years since you'd sojourned in Oxford? Sorry? Did, did you find that things at in London had altered greatly at the LSE in the eight years that you'd been away? The LSE never altered. <laughs> <laughs> There's nearly always a rat in the front hall. <laughs> <laughs> with people shouting obscenities at the governors, which is silly of them because uh, <laughs> <laughs> the governors do a lot of work for the place and bring in a lot of money. Yeah. Um, who were your main colleagues at this time, Professor Milson? At the LSE, I don't think I had any, if you know what I mean. Yes. Um, <coughs> I was pretty much left to my own devices. Must have been quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, they provided me with a room which was very, very hard to find. And that was good. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I've, I, I've done it too already once. I, I find myself confusing my two periods at the LSE in my mind, as yes, it were. It's, hmm. there, it's, 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 you, you became a fellow of the Academy in 1967. Yeah. What did this involve? I mean, did you have a, a sort of a role that you had to play? Or? Well, um... It is divided into sections, and I was put into the lawyer's section, um, and they meet twice a year, and until recently I always went to those meetings. Um, I, I don't now because I can't get to London or indeed outside, and um, anyway I wouldn't... Uh, it's all about electing new fellows, and I wouldn't know enough about anybody. You know, I'm too too much out of things. So, um, nowadays, it's just a question of... I think down there, there is a booklet which has come from the Academy, which, I, if I read up, will tell me what's going on. <laughs> nice to be able to follow. Yeah. Um, it... It um, its main business is electing other fellows, um, uh, including um, overseas fellows who, uh, and that's very difficult because um, only the really the extremely eminent has one ever heard of. Who you knows? Yes. <laughs> Um, but uh, it goes on it gives one employment twi twice a year and they have dinners um, they invited old Plucknett to speak at one of their dinners and I have this Dreadful, he was such a nice man. Dreadful memory of him droning on interminably. And I think we found out afterwards that he'd been reading his PhD dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. <laughs> um, he was a, a very nice man, totally removed from the world. Um, his wife managed his life, I think, and had no idea what he did. So far as she was concerned, he went off to business every morning. <laughs> <laughs> and really, she had. She was a French lady from. Um, I think 
think, was it not Massachusetts? Hmm? Had she taught, not taught in Massachusetts? She, she, she did, indeed, she taught French, and that's where he met her. She was a very odd lady. You know, she really, really had no idea what he did, how he spent his time. Extraordinary. Um, and in his study, um, he would get, when a Selden Society volume got into proof, it would first come in galley proofs. And he would string them at the top, <laughs> plea rolls were strung at the top like that, and have them hang. And these things were festooned all around his study. And uh, I think she dusted them. <laughs> <laughs> His, yeah. it, it, you, I, I, I think you read my notice of him. His father was a bootmaker. Yes. Um, or rather, a teacher of. He he taught at all the big technical colleges on. Them. And um, when that obituary was published, his wife never spoke to me again. She didn't want it known that her husband's father had been a bootman. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> when I asked her what he'd done, early on when I was trying to find out about him, she, she said, well, I, I think he was a teacher. Well, he was, in a sense, because he, he did, did teach boot technology. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but she was yeah. really furious. Uh, and she wouldn't speak to me um, uh, after that obituary was published. And I was really rather sad about that yes. because um, she was a nice soul. Oh, sad. But she retired to her native clermont Ferrand, um, and I'm sure she's dead by now. She was a bit younger than he, but not all that much. And, He's been dead a long time. Mm -hmm. I think, was it 19... Could it have been 65? Something like that, yeah. Yes. Professor Wilson, it was during your time at LSE that you started visiting Yale. And this too proved a very long association because you continued visiting for 18 years. A yes. of nine visits. Yes. And you must have obviously enjoyed it there as well. Yes. They were very good to us, um, and they always found us... The, the, I think the very first visit, they put us up in one of their dormitories. And I think my wife let her disapproval be known. <laughs> anyway, after that, we were <laughs> very well looked after. <laughs> It was, it was always, uh, there were these very clever people with absolutely no knowledge of legal history or any other history um, uh, asking very sharp questions. It must have been delightful for them to have had someone like yourself as a visiting scholar. I, I, from the, 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 the time... Uh, I mean, it lasted through so many years. They might... They, if they disliked it, they must have. Uh, they would have said so. <laughs> yes. yes. Mm. So you you went sort of roughly every two years or so. Yes. Yeah. Very nice. Um, late August, early September, not the best time for New York City, but okay if you were in the Dean's Park penthouse, which we were after our first visit. So when you went to Yale, did you did you not stay in, in New Haven? Yeah, we were put up once in a apartment block in the in downtown New Haven. Oh. Um, and after that they always found us a, a house or apartment, somebody was on leave, that sort of thing. And so we were in 
lovely accommodation. More comfort, yes. Yes. Not always, not always ideal, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But it was it, it was enjoyable, and it was partly enjoyable because the um, the students were always uh, like the NYU lot. They they knew not, nothing. They didn't really want to know anything, but they could ask a mean question. <laughs> <laughs> In 1972, you were the Maitland Memorial Lecturer. Presumably this reflected your interest in Maitland. Yes. What did this position entail, Professor Wilson? I think I gave five lectures. Um, I think they're published somewhere. Were, were these in... At, at Yale? Hmm? Did you give the lectures at... Where did you give the lectures, Professor Wilson? In Cambridge. In Cambridge. Yeah. Yes, right. At, at, right. In Cambridge, yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, they were nearly always in one of the... I mean, a telephone booth would have been fine, <laughs> but one of the small lecture rooms in the, in the old school... Mm. Um, uh, and once uh, the economists were sitting in and so I had to give them in the old combination room in Trinity hmm. and that was all right <laughs> <laughs> yes. you, you visited Harvard in 1973 the Department of History. Mm. Um, do you have any recollections of this time? I mean, did you teach courses, or was it just a short visit? I taught. Um, I taught a course to undergraduate historians, and another course in the law school, oh. um, and. It was a, a time of revolution. Uh, and as I was going to my undergraduate course one day, a very large student came up and stood over me and said, Mr. Milton, we really oughtn't to be giving this lecture. Um, and really, I didn't have time to think, so I said, well, uh, but then I'm just... An, unreconstructed fascist pig. <laughs> he was so shocked, he stood back and let me pass. <laughs> my, some of my flock had, were following me at a distance. They, they didn't uh, want to get involved in all this, but they were quite impressed. <laughs> We don't have we don't have student revolutions these days, do we? There was a sit in was it last year or earlier this year? Really? In the law faculty. Oh really? Yes. And, and was it the lawyers sitting in? No. It was somebody else altogether, yes. That's that, right. They actually occupied the faculty. Yes. And um, for example the economists. I don't even think it, it was The Economist. I think it was... Um, I, 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 I certainly didn't like the look of them, if I may say. <laughs> <laughs> um, Economist. <laughs> <laughs> very um, prepossessing. And um, mm. uh, David Feldman was the chair, chairman at that time. Who? D D David Feldman. Oh, right. And um, I remember thinking it must have been rather awkward for him because they were demonstrating um, in favour of Palestine. So um, they stayed for hmm, about a week and the law students finally got fed up. 
<laughs> through, and, uh, through the mud? <laughs> yes. But, uh, Good. Well, not really. I mean, they wanted them to go, but finally uh, it was the old schools who took a stand. Mm. Uh, what the devil they thought they could do for the Palestinians by occupying the law school in Cambridge. Yes. Very mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we must do something, I can just hear some man. Oh dear. But, um, well. Just as well I never knew about it, I might have joined them. Because <laughs> 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 I get very cross. <laughs> about the treatment of the Palestinians. Yeah, but mm. that's right. Mm. But, um, you know, I mean, there are way, uh, ways of expressing one's... Absolutely. And uh, bringing a law school... To, I mean, they actually were occupying a lecture theatre, so that lectures had to be cancelled. Um, but, um, Professor Wilson, you also, during this time, visited Indiana... This was in 1973, where you gave the Addison Harris Memorial Lecture. Do you recall that? Yes. Um, <clears throat> the dean at that time um, of the Bloomington campus <coughs> was an, a very old friend of mine and he invited me to go. Um, and I don't really have much... Uh, I gave the sort of course I always give, I think. Um, <laughs> um, my, I have two chief memories. One is that the World Basketball Championships were being held in Bloomington. And the thing about championship basketball is that everybody's over, over eight feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my wife and I were being put up in a, a, a dormitory. It was a nice apartment. And there was the most gosh awful noise. And uh, I was cowering. And my wife stormed out <laughs> and said, Go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and <but> they did. <laughs> and we went to bed and sleep. And then there was a bang on the door. And a very drunk gentleman, middle-aged gentleman. I'm so sorry, I, I gather my students have been causing trouble. I do apologise <laughs> that my wife had to tell him to go to bed too. <laughs> and the other thing I remember about that was that they, um, we found out afterwards um, that they had ago they had legionnaire's disease in the waterworks on the premises and uh, my, my wife and I were terribly lucky I think because on a nice day we would go out and sit beside a little stream that ran through the grounds which was in fact the, the, the water system being recycled <laughs> <laughs> we could easily have got it yes. um, but we didn't It, Bloomington is dry. Uh, the campus is dry. And when we got there, our host said, well, look, you can't be putting up with that. I'll show you where to get the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Took us along and gave a special sort of knock on a door and identified himself so these are friends they'll want supplies from time to time <laughs> <laughs> it was very funny um, well, 
must have been a, a nice contrast to New York. Much oh, absolutely. The a total contrast. Uh, including the, the one thing I've always remembered from that time in Bloomington. Um, the roads were safer than any roads I've ever known. Um, if you approached an intersection uh, in, a, in a car, you had to stop dead. No good saying down, you had to stop dead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and policemen were there checking on you, if you see what I mean. <laughs> so that road accidents were really almost eliminated. And uh, needless to say, uh, enormous courtesy. I, if two cars had stopped, each would be waving the other <laughs> on. <laughs> well, I'm always impressed by how, how polite Americans are. Mm. Yes, in England, anything goes on the roads, doesn't it? It's dreadful. Yes. But, I mean, even more generally, it's, it's you know, it doesn't happen in England that um, a man will sort of step aside. No. Uh, but it, that's very commonplace. No, absolutely, States, that's right. These days, yeah. you know, with a man, you know, it's, it's actually... Last time I ventured into town alone, I was nearly knocked over by a young woman oh, really? on foot... Good heavens. I mean, there was this old old creature in the head getting in the way. How shocking. I nearly, you know, I very nearly went over. So I'm I'm, uh, ashamed to say I I now won't go into town by myself. I don't blame you, Mm. Professor Nelson, no. Well, if you ever need some assistance, (laughs) it would be a pleasure. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you very much. (laughs) Yeah. Well, your researches in legal history resulted in your becoming a fellow of the Royal Historical Society in 1970. And you were also a member of the Royal Commission on Historical Manuscripts Mm -hmm. in 1975. Do you have any memories of the circumstances? Um, I never went to a meeting of the Royal Historical Society. Um, uh, I never had anything really to do with it. That was kindness on their part. Um, yes, I used to go to the uh, Manuscripts Commission. Um, it was... They had an office off Chancery Lane, a little place called Quality Court. Um, and it was an interesting... It was divided between, the commission was divided between consumers, and I suppose I was meant to be a consumer of manuscripts, uh, and owners. And the chief owner was the then Duke of Northumberland, who came every time. He never missed, um, and... uh, his rose would be waiting outside for him <laughs> to take him back to Zion House in Chiswick, which is his London establishment, as it were. <laughs> so, I mean, he, he didn't write, presumably. He, he wasn't... He didn't publish. No, no, no. No. Um, but he... Uh, the... Problem that the commission was constantly up against um, was that one wanted to persuade owners uh, to let scholars come and see their stuff. Um, And the owners weren't always too willing because uh, only the very richest had a permanent librarian uh, and they weren't any too keen on letting their treasures. Just go go walk about. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, scholars who wanted to visit. It was it was qu- quite an interesting. I think we met twice a year, and it was quite fun. Um, and uh, the Duke apart, the, they were interesting people. 
and the it ceased to exist in some Whitehall economy move, and it was is it is now part of the National Archive in Chiswick, and they have offices there. I, um, uh, I believe I've never been there. I, Getting to Chiswick is none too easy <laughs> these days. <laughs> so I mean, I had to I resigned that when when they moved. I think. Mm. So in 1970, you became an honorary bencher. What did that involve, Professor Wilson? Nothing much, really. Um, I get invi- I still get invited to all the grand do's. Um, and I hope I still normally reply. Uh, but I think they know I'm not going to come by now. <laughs> so is this in one of the inns? Yes, uh, Lincoln's Inn, yes. I see. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I guess that's my trying to save space for who's who. Um, I think honorary venture is detached from the words Lincoln's Inn somehow, but uh, but yes, it is Lincoln's Inn. Right. Mm. I wondered about that. I couldn't find much information. I had a little look on the internet, but it wasn't... That clear. It wasn't that clear to me. It's you know what what actually is involved with nothing. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> One gets invited to these it's grand dinners. Um, it must be very enjoyable, though. Well, at first I used to go, and so long as I went, I would know enough people to make sense of it. But. Um, I think when I moved back to Cambridge, um, I didn't go very often, and now I I wouldn't know any of them if I went. Um, Oh, they were just... They were like college feasts. Stuff here (laughs) first. Well, Professor Wilson, do you, would you be happy to continue or shall we deal with your time at Cambridge in um, perhaps two weeks' time? Uh, because it, it, it's quite an important section and there's quite a bit to cover. And if, if you feel you... Shall we, shall we, we put it off then? And that, do, that do, is that all right? That I'm ta- I, I do feel badly about dragging you around here. Oh, but it's my pleasure. It's um, an absolute pleasure. I could get to the faculty, but oh, um, I mean, if you would like to come to the faculty, I'd love, yeah. I'd love to I couldn't entertain you. But getting into taxes is hell. Getting out of them is almost impossible. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> oh, because um, so I'm more or less husband. Uh, you know, I just don't go. Out. Right. My kind minder does my shopping for me. Wonderful. That's, well, in that case, if we arrange for perhaps a week or two's time Mm -hmm. I can then just thank you so much again for a wonderful interview and just to say how grateful I am